This week, Conflict Zone is in Berlin, and so is my guest, the Iraqi Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi. You wouldn't want his job, really, running a country that's drowning in violence and corruption and occupied in large swathes by so-called Islamic State. So does the Iraqi government actually control anything at all? Haida Al-Abadi, welcome to Conflict Zone. Okay, thank you. When you were in Davos at the World Economic Forum, you gave a very bleak assessment of your position. You said, it's impossible to run the country, to be honest with you, to sustain the military, to sustain jobs, to sustain the economy. Sounded like a prime minister giving up. Are you giving up? No, I just tried to explain the challenges so the world can stand with us. Pretty bleak challenges. Well, they were. I mean, when, when the, our income from oil drops to 15% to what they were two years ago, and we have war at our hand, that war is not with the local terrorist organization, but with the international terrorist organization, and we have liberated... Uh, I mean, that organization was controlling 40% of the Iraqi land when I took over. Now they're only controlling 16% of that land. It means we have liberated many of these areas. I think we have succeeded in the challenge. All right, well, we'll come to that in a minute. Yes. But, but in the short time since 2014 that you've been in power, you've made many promises, haven't you? And uh, some of them haven't come true, have they? When you came to power, you promised to heal the Sunni Shiite rift. According to the Brookings Institution, there's an absence of any meaningful reconciliation between Sunni and Shia now in the country. Well, I think. So you didn't uh, deliver on that? Well, I don't know where they're living, probably in another planet. I think now, if you look two years ago, our military were not welcome in the Sunni areas, in Ramadi and other areas. They are very much welcome, and the local people are fighting alongside our military to take the city back, and we took it back. They are very much welcome. So I think that harmony between communities is back in Tikrit. Well, Sunni and Shia are blowing each other up in car bombs and suicide bombs. Well, that's... that's daily, not, aren't they? Well, Almost daily in your country. Not, not true. That's not a reconciliation, not. is it? If you look at terrorist attacks in Baghdad, they had dropped drastically. That's why a single terrorist attack, you hear it in the news now, before it, it used to be two, three a day. You're building more checkpoints. No, it's less checkpoints. It's the opposite. I don't know where you get that portion from. In from Baghdad, the interior minister. No. From the in, interior ministry. Well, in, they said they are building more checkpoints it's to less, cut off the routes that ISIS uses to take their car bombs into now, the city. Now, uh, I'm talking statistics. It's not a measure of success when you build more checkpoints. No, it's the Is opposite. It? We have reduced checkpoints in the cities. People are free to But not to in move. Baghdad. It's been in Baghdad. If you go in Baghdad, long distance, everybody in Baghdad now, even... You, you talk to, to foreign ambassadors in Baghdad. They said, we haven't seen the city as peaceful as it is at the moment. I've removed a, a night curfew, which has been in place since 2003. I've removed hundreds of checkpoints in the city. There's many less checkpoints. The city is much peaceful than before. Well, then your interior ministry is saying something else. I do, the I, brigadier um, who's in charge of uh, spokes, being a spokesman for the ministry said that um, they were building new checkpoints. No, we are, no, that's different. Now we are... You, we, you objected to the, the term building a wall, and they said we are building new checkpoints. Exactly, around Baghdad, not inside Baghdad. And that's not exactly uh, a sign of confidence, is no, it? No, it is a sign of confidence. It's right. the opposite. We're trying to make the country more peaceful. I'm trying to make the movement of the public much easier. Now we have difficulties in moving citizens going into Baghdad because Baghdad is a capital, is the home of 23% of the population of Iraq, terrorists are trying to return back to their bombing campaign as they used to be before. We're trying to prevent that and to make the movement of the people much, much more peaceful. It's the opposite exactly. We're right, Prime Minister, you've also promised that uh, you would eliminate corruption. 2016 is the year of eliminating corruption. You know it's not a tap that you can simply turn off. Corruption is endemic in, in your country, isn't it? It's another promise that you can't deliver on, isn't it? Well, I agree, but uh, this is... Uh, but there's a promise that we will put the procedure to eliminate uh, corruptions. Corruption will take a long time to, 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 to erode. Uh, 2016 is the year of eliminating corruption, you said in a speech, January the 9th. There is no such thing as acceptable corruption. You're not going to eliminate it in 2016, Well, that's, that's for the Ministry of Interior. That was speech for the 
uh, the, the establishment uh, or for the Ministry of uh, Interior. But if you make promises that you can't deliver on, how can people trust no, you? For how can people trust you? For 2016, I made a promise for the Ministry of Interior that was for that will eliminate corruption in the ministry. It's so right. Just in the ministry? That was for particular that ministry. Because that wasn't but in the translation. Well, it, because... It's the year of eliminating corruption. For the Ministry so of Interior, it was, the speech was for that. And I think uh, we have started this process. I want to eliminate it. Corruption is a disease, and sometimes it's institutional, institutionalized. I want to remove this. When you remove it, you almost killed corruption, but it stay, stay there. It take a few years to remove it. But at least I'll make bureaucracy, I'll remove bureaucracy, red tape, make it easier for the citizens, for the companies, for the private sector to work in the country. But well, that's your aim. You can't promise it. That's well, your no, aim. We're moving it? along that line. And once I do that, it means I've killed corruption from source. Perhaps the biggest promise you've made, Prime Minister, is that Iraq will be free of Islamic State in 2016. 2016, you say, will be the year of the big and final victory when Daesh's, Islamic State's, presence in Iraq will be terminated. If you can't deliver that this year in 2016, will you resign? Well, it, it, well I don't mind to resign at any moment, but not to renegade the country, not to give up my responsibilities. There but this is a solemn promise, isn't it? Well, it's this year... To clear Daesh out of Iraq in 2016. This is your promise. My promise is this. We are starting a campaign to liberate Nainawa, Mosul. So you're redefining and your promise. Well, right? I said it exactly like that. I was talking about Mosul. And in Mosul, this is the last campaign. This is the last place where Daesh is controlling. And in this year, we've already started... What about started Fallujah? Fallujah is under siege as well. Well, Fallujah was under siege two years ago before Daesh rolled into the country. So that's a completely different story. I'm, I'm addressing this. Uh, but no, but Daesh still controls tens I know of thousands of square kilometers of your territory. Well, it's only 16%, was 40%, now 16% of that land is controlled by Daesh. That's a huge success. Uh, it I, is, I, and you've said yourself, there's still a very dangerous threat in Iraq. Well, of course. So yeah. I come back to how can you get rid no, of them no, that easily in 2016, as you well, promised to do? Terrorism is not my problem. It is on me, but that's an international community problem. Daesh was created outside Iraq and was enabled to cross the border into Iraq and occupy large chunks of Iraq and destroy cities and make millions of people refugees into their own country. We're trying to reverse that, but the, the terrorism is an international problem. There are bombings in Paris, there are problems, bombings in Europe. Well, we're just talking about what's happening in Iraq at the well, well, of course. And no, you, no. you've taken back Tikrit, you took back Sinja, Beji, and now Ramadi. But when it comes to Ramadi, you shouldn't have lost Ramadi in the first place. ISIS was outnumbered by uh, your forces, and yet they still lost the city. And according to the US Defense Secretary, who was speaking last May, the problem was that the will of the Iraqis to fight ISIL and defend themselves wasn't there. What can you tell me to assure people that that will to fight is there? We proved it on the ground. Our forces have liberated not only Ramadi, all the with areas. huge American help. All areas surrounding... With huge American help. Well, I'm not denying this. From the air, not on the ground. The only people who are fighting on the ground are Iraqis, by, with their own blood. We haven't lost a single foreign force in Iraq because they are from the air, supporting our forces. And now 60% almost of air combat are carried out by Iraqis. We didn't have that a year and a half ago. Now we build our capabilities much better than before, and we are relying on, our, on well, ourselves. Well, you say you've built the capabilities more than before. In 2015, the Pentagon said it had planned to train 24,000 Iraqi soldiers, but only 7,000 turned up and only 2,000 for a counterterrorism service. So it doesn't sound like much of a will to fight with so few people turning up to fight, does it? Well, I think, uh, I think that's a claim which I have proved is, is not credible on the ground. We liberated not only Ramadi, but a large chunk of that area. Before, when I inherited that place, our forces were inside Ramadi, where all the areas outside Ramadi was controlled by Daesh, not anymore. So you're saying the, the Pentagon doesn't know what it's talking about? Well, I think they have their opinion. Uh, I don't know when that was said. All right, last October, just four months ago, General Mick Bednarik, former senior US officer in Iraq, estimated that you have only five functioning divisions, roughly 50,000 men, with fighting readiness of between 60 and 65%. That's not very much, is it? No, I think is we have more than that. 
Above. Five out of 14 divisions well, serviceable, only up to 60 or 65 percent. No, I think we have more than that at the moment. You we think? Have, we're, we're not we're, sure. No, no, we've increased uh, the numbers. Don't forget, our, many of our forces collapse when Daesh rolled into Iraq. We have to rebuild that. Uh, I don't have like uh, a, some, a, a rapid uh, fix for this. We have to build it. We are moving in the right direction. We have liberated large areas of our country. Daesh on, is on the retreat at the moment, militarily. But if you talk about security threat, it's not only Baghdad or, or Iraq is threatened, London is threatened. All the world is threatened by Daesh. But you have in Fallujah at the moment a humanitarian disaster, don't you? You have people dying because they don't have enough food. Well, there are people... How in all conscience could you let that happen? There are people dying in Syria in their, in their thousands. There are people dying in Mosul because Daesh, somebody has enabled Daesh to come into Iraq and control uh, Mosul. And there are people dying in Fallujah because some countries have enabled Daesh to come there and conquer the city and control it. Some countries, is, which countries? Well, I mean, them? well, you know, I, I mean, well, some, Daesh. Some countries, which well, countries? Well, Daesh is not spontaneous. It's not like terrorist organization was created for nothing. No, but you've made an accusation. Which countries well, are we talking about? Uh, well, I'm about? talking about facts. Well, uh, okay, so give me the facts. Well, so. I mean, you which have country? to. Well, I think it's, it's not, it's not, I mean, probably the, I mean, some of your foreign ministers, some of your politicians will tell you that which countries are supporting, I think. And you won't tell me. No, the problem you're is... You're going to make an accusation, but no, you're not going to back it I'm, up I'm, with a fact I'm, I'm talking about fact here. Okay, so give now, me the fact. Daesh, no, Daesh is the terrorist organization who has been armed, equipped, and was trained in Syria, and crossed into Iraq all of a sudden, and occupied many cities in Iraq. If that has happened spontaneously, without any support, I don't think the world, the world is right. So you're There's not, somewhere wrong in the world. So what are you going to do about this humanitarian disaster with people well, dying of starvation? We are helping. We are helping. We're Why don't you end the siege of Fallujah? It's not a siege at the moment. It's, we don't have a siege. Humanitarian the, aid is not getting in. Well, no, we are getting humanitarian aid. The government has the UN announced... The says the situation is terrible. I'm saying it's city. terrible not now. It's terrible for the last two years. People being executed, being killed. They have been starved in the city and in Mosul and other areas. They've been killed by the day by Daesh. We're trying to liberate the people. Meanwhile, Daesh is using the people as a human shield. They're trying to kill them. They're trying to cause hunger to them. We have opened safe corridors for the population and for the civil civilians, and we are welcoming them to leave the city to other safe areas. What chances have you got of taking Mosul this year? Kurdistan's Deputy Prime Minister, Kubad Talabani, said last month, I don't think the Mosul offensive could happen this year. I don't think the Iraqi armed forces are ready. And I don't think the US-led coalition is confident in the ability of everyone to get ready in time for an offensive this year. So no offensive on Mosul this year? No, we started, uh, I mean, we're ready. We started uh, deploying forces in, uh, in, in East Mosul uh, last week. And they are ongoing, our process is ongoing. We are on plan now to start but the operation But this is a huge Mosul. enterprise. This is not like Ramadi. This is a completely different battle you're going to have to fight here, isn't Well, it? I know it's unlike Ramadi. I know it's unlike Beji, where Daesh has recruited and pushed for their best terrorist fighters to take it back. They couldn't. We liberated it. We liberated the Crete. We liberated Ramadi. And I hope, and we are planning to be successful in retaking Mosul back. One of David uh, Petraeus's former intelligence advisors, Michael Pregent, said last month, the force to retake Mosul hasn't been built yet. We can't take it back with Peshmerga and Christian forces, and we certainly can't take it back with Shia militias. But we'll take it back with Iraqi security forces and with people inside the city. Even with much fewer numbers and, by your own admission, an army that you can no longer fund because you don't have the money. Well, that's another it. problem. Yes, we don't have the, fu the funding, enough funding. But we have the so you haven't got the funding to take Mosul. But we, well, we haven't had the funding for 2015. Our oil income has dropped for t the whole of 2015 to 30 percent or to th a third of what it was. But we liberated Tikrit, we liberated Aramadi, we liberated a lot of Which other. Which you should areas. never have lost. Well, yeah, we should have never lost, but we were in a very critical position where a lot of the city and the surrounding area was under the control of Daesh. And our army were, didn't have the capability to fight back Daesh because they didn't, didn't have the weapons. Or didn't have the will. No, they, the didn't, they didn't have the weapons against truck bombs. Prime Minister, let's talk, if we may, about the Shiite militias who gained enormously in power and influence under your leadership. 
Their leader, Hadi Al-Amiri, seems to think he can push you around when he feels like it. Last September, he said in a television interview that if the Shiite groups didn't like US military actions in Iraq, we can go to Abadi, he said, and the government and pressure them. Either you will do this or we will do that. Is that the relationship you have with Shiite militias? They push you around? Well, militias are not allowed by Iraqi constitution. Okay, so you've taken them in under your wing. Now you pay for them, but they are Shiite militias nonetheless. Well, huh? now we have all Iraqi citizens fighting alongside Iraqi security forces under the Public Mobilization Force, which is legal force under the Iraqi budget, which has been approved by parliament. They're fighting alongside our security forces to liberate their own areas. They may be fighting alongside, but they're widespread human rights abuses reported both by the UN and human rights groups have been pushing Sunnis into the arms of Daesh, haven't they? Well, they have been before. Well, that's why Daesh was there in the first place. But there are much more, I mean, Sunni communities are siding with us. If you look in, in for, for uh, Ramadi, civilians are moving, were moving in their thousands towards our security forces in a safe area, leaving Daesh. Prime Minister, you say this, but two, two weeks ago, these militia groups were accused by Human Rights Watch of possible war crimes in the abduction and killing of scores of Sunni civilians in the east of your country and in the unlawful destruction of their property. I'm talking about Muqtadiyah the cafe bombing that took place there. In retaliation, your militias attacked Sunnis as well as their homes and mosques and killed at least a dozen people. We don't have militias. Look, uh, there are eyewitness reports. Yeah, we don't have, I don't have militias in the state. There are outlaws. There are people who are taking the law into their own, own hands. We have Daesh who's taking the law into their own hands. They are criminals, we are fighting them. And there are other criminal gangs who are taking the law into their own hands. One, one, eyewitness said, one eyewitness said ISIS may have been behind the cafe bombing, but the attacks on Sunni houses, mosques, and people in our area was the League of the Righteous. And the League of the Righteous is a Shiite militia group, isn't it? Well, that's a statement. If I have a proof for that, I will act. I went myself. Three days after the bombing, I saw by myself, it was so spontaneous. It was a criminal act. But the one who had this bombing of the cafe and killed many people, the number that has been killed by the bombing are the major bombing. Only six people has been killed in the aftermath. Once again, Human Rights Watch says, civilians are paying the price for Iraq's failure to rein in out of control militias. And this has been a widespread pattern in the region, hasn't it? Human Rights Watch says both ISIS and Iraq's government-affiliated militias are committing atrocities against civilians with evident support from their commanders. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights says he's had these reports as well, very disturbing reports. I well. have these reports. And you, and you claim that no, these, these crimes aren't taking place. I'm not saying that. I said we're not proud of them, we combat them, and we try to remove them, but I need evidence. Every time I challenge for evidence, I want to catch these people. I don't want to punish the whole communities. I cannot do that. I cannot punish the Sunnis because of Daesh. I cannot punish the Shia because of some militias or outlaws. I have to find the culprits, catch them, and punish them by law. If people don't produce evidence for me, I cannot do it. Now, Daesh is committing... But you know it's going on. Of course, people are afraid well, well, to I... come forward and testify because there's so much hatred between the groups, the groups that you said were reconciling, but not exactly on the evidence of the atrocities that we're seeing, well, carried out by Shia militias in Sunni areas, destruction of property, abduction of people, I mean, that's... extrajudicial killing. Well, that's, These I are think, facts of life which have been reported well, by the human rights well, groups which it, and you know this is going on. But not to the extent you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're, you're right. bringing your information from. Washington no, 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 you've taken excerpts from certain things out of their context. You're taking excerpts by me out of their context. This is not acceptable. I don't accept this. I don't, this is very hostile. Iraq is fighting a war against terrorism. We're trying our best to fight them. We're trying the best to fight outlaws in our country. Is not, is not black and white. I cannot just turn the country upside down in one day. There are a lot of problems in this country. A lot of countries intervening in my country. There has been a lot of support to terrorism, to militias in my country. We're trying to fix it. I cannot carry responsibility for everything wrong. We're trying to rectify it. I'm not responsible for criminals. I catch them when I have evidence. I cannot catch people like this. I cannot execute people in the streets. I mean, I need justice in the country, 
and I need evidence. We are doing our best to do it. Yes, there are criminal activities. There are people working against us. There are people trying to weaken the country, but we are performing. Iraq, look, uh, one and a half year ago, the country was at the brink of division, a brink of the whole total collapse. We are in a much better position now than that time. The Washington representatives for these militia groups or popular mobilization forces, a man called Bassam Rida, told a US news outlet this month that he knew such abuses were happening, but said they couldn't stop them. More disturbingly, he revealed that no one has been jailed for any of these atrocities. He said they go inside prison, inside the military camps, and usually they are let go. They've done a lot of vicious activities, a lot of bad crimes, but they get away with it. Why do they get away well, with it? Well, I, I talked to Human Rights Watch. I, want them, I, I told them I want the evidence. I want to catch these people. Yes. If you have evidence, well, they said we get some information by telephone, and we ask people, and we cannot give evidence for that. And most of the stories they are giving, I investigate it and give them the answers for that, as far as my investigation are going through. I want, as a prime minister, to catch criminals wherever they are, whatever hat they are wearing, even if they are among the Iraq security forces. They only belong to themselves in their crimes. They, they don't belong to the Iraq security forces. And we have to stop them. And we have been doing this for some time. But now, Human Rights Watch is not making up these stories. The UN Human Rights Commission well, is not making the up role, these stories. The role of a human That's rights it. agencies is to expose human rights uh, abuses. And they're not going to say... On the basis of the testimony they well, get of from course they have to. Well, I mean, that's their job. I'm happy they with don't, that. They don't make it up. Well, we have our own human rights organization inside Iraq. They are independent from the government. They've been voted in by parliament. And they're doing their job. They give me, they give me evidence. They give me reports. I act among, uh, according to this and according to the information you have. But if these um, abuses don't stop, it's a return to the, the days of dictatorship, isn't it? Well, I know, yes, but not by the state. We are fighting them. There are two different things. But they're out of control, aren't well, they? Well, they are. Daesh, Daesh is, is... Not Daesh, not just Daesh, no, no, but I the say, militias as well. Well, it's a control. reaction. When Daesh comes in, there's a reaction to our Daesh, and everything is under control. We're bringing it to bring it all under control. We have to catch these criminals. We have to punish them, and we are doing it. Yes, maybe not in Afghan, because it's a very hard situation. It's a war. And in the war, you cannot catch people easily. You cannot investigate many things in the war. It takes time to investigate things. Do you have the power to enact real change in Iraq? Fighting a war on so many different fronts, fighting with corruption, fighting with political opposition, fighting with Daesh, Islamic State in your country. Do you really have the power to enact real change? Well, it depends all political blocks. I think we, we have a system. The prime minister is on and is on. We have the judiciary, you have parliament, uh, and uh, you have other forces. Like Parliament's forces. tried to block your, your reforms, well, haven't I mean, they? Well, that is, well, that's politics, as everywhere. You have a problem between par Parliament and... The Prime Minister's got to take Parliament with him. You're not taking Parliament no, with you, are you? No, it's, it's... They blocked your reforms. No, no, they, they couldn't block all of it. I mean, they blocked part of it. It's not easy. I had reforms. That reforms has touched on sensitive issues, which some political blocks didn't like. So they tried to block it, but they couldn't block all of them. We a member have of the Parliamentary Finance Committee said, we withdrew the power that we gave to Mr. Abadi because his behavior was unconstitutional. Abadi is neglecting Parliament, he said. Well, that's a view, of course. This uh, is Masood Haider. Well, I don't know the guy. But still, but still I think, uh, I mean, he's right to have his statement. That we have 200, 328 parliamentarians. Not all of them are happy with the government. They want to have their say against the government. I welcome that. And uh, I listen to it. Is your country ungovernable? No, it is governable. No, no money? Everyone trying to grab what they can? Well, as many, many countries, they went through this, through the collapse of economy. Our economy didn't collapse yet. It's collapse of economy, collapse of security. Well, it's all linked, but there is no collapse. Yes, we have a problem. This is not our own making when the oil prices goes down. This is a problem outside Iraq. But we have to manage our economy, we have to manage our country. We're trying our best and we'll win. You're coming up to a crucial reshuffle of your cabinet. You promised that you would end the system whereby political blocks get uh, a portion of the uh, appointments. There may be a vote of no confidence in you. Well, it's okay if Parliament decides that. Are you prepared to go? No, it's, it's, that's uh, democracy. If they decide, uh, I'm prepared to go. Your position is that fragile at the moment? Well, it isn't fragile, no. 
uh, I disagree. I called for uh, uh, amendment to the government, for government reshuffle. Uh, it is time, I think, to do it now. The political blocks, I call upon them to cooperate with me to do that. Uh, um, I, I know some positions will still be political positions because this is a political government. My position is political myself as a prime minister of the country. And I understand some would be political appointees. Uh, I'm happy with that as long as uh, they can carry on the job, not just appointees with that abilities. They must have the abilities to do their job. All right. Prime Minister Haider Al-Abadi, thanks very much for being on Conflict Zone. Thank you.